Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I thought I'd revisit Rubber Soul, the classic Beatles album from December 65. Haven't done it for several years, and probably it's most of the fans' choice for what should be coming out later this year in terms of new product, archive edition, deluxe box set. I'm not sure, I'm not positive that we need another remix of Rubber Soul or endless outtakes either. I tend to be one of these people who, when, when it comes out, I listen to the outtakes, but then within a few months, I'm going back to the, the original produced album. And I think this is an, another example of where I would be doing that. Um, but anyway, it would be interesting to see what's out there in terms of additional um, alternate takes, etc. Although we did have quite a lot already released on the anthology too, of course. Um, so a bit of background, this album was released on December the 3rd, 1965, 14 new tracks, a uh, pretty good early Christmas present for Beatles fans, and also on the same day, a track, a double A side single of two tracks which weren't even on the album, We Can Work It Out and Day Tripper. So in total, 16 new tracks, which would have kept the fans very busy in the lead up to Christmas and beyond. Um, this is my original UK copy. It's not an original 60s pressing, I think it's a 70s reissue. But what's interesting about the early stereo pressing, and this is a stereo mix, is um, the separation was very um, noticeable and um, the Beatles themselves hadn't really paid much attention to the stereo mix. But the st it, when I was growing up in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, the stereo one was the version available in record shops and the mono was very hard to find. So I grew up with the stereo and the separate separation is almost ridiculously um, separate, <laughs> pun not intended. So for example, if you went to a party and you were sitting by one speaker, uh, you would hear certain instruments and if you were sitting by the other speaker, you'd hear the other. Um, and if one speaker wasn't working, it made for quite an interesting uh, listening experience because you only had half the band performing. So I th they did rectify that on the later stereo pressings, 2009, maybe even on in 87 they, re they rectified the stereo mix. I think George Martin had another go at it. Certainly in 2009 they did. Um, Giles Martin has yet to um, have a go at this one, but no doubt he will before too long. Um, so other copies in my collection. This is a German first press, again stereo on the Odeon label with the UK track listing. This is my UK copy. It says first press. Um, I'm not positive if it is. Here's the inner sleeve for those of you who want to comment or not whether you think this is first press and it's on the rainbow label the capital. And um, obviously the US pressing has a different track listing. They only selected 10 out of the 14 tracks from the UK album and then put on a couple of tracks left over from Help, which weren't on the US Help release, um, which made for quite an interesting listening experience. But um, And the US would do far worse in terms of al other albums which came out after this. Um, but this one was quite a reasonable attempt at an alternative track listing. I don't have a huge problem with it. In fact, I'm glad to have both versions. But the UK version for me is the one I grew up with. It's the one I'm going to mainly review here. This is my 2009 um, remaster. And then this is the mono from the mono box. I still don't have a copy of Rubber Soul on mono vinyl, so I'm on the lookout for that. I'm not willing to pay a huge amount of money for it, but I'm on the lookout. And this is my US CD, which is interesting because it has on one on one disc both the mono and the stereo. So that was pretty good value, actually. Um, anyway, going back to, to the album, well, what, what can we say about it? Well, you could make a pretty strong argument that this is John Lennon's peak as a songwriter. Um, obviously, he would have other peaks, such as the 67 psychedelic period, the, the stuff he did for the White Album, and um, his early solo work, they are often considered peaks, but uh, I, and I certainly could make a case for the songs on this album being a complete peak for John Lennon and Cynthia, his first wife, often made that remark. If you just look at the sheer quality of Lennon's songs here, it's, it's almost ridiculous. Norwegian Wood, In My Life, Girl, Nowhere Man, 
and Run For Your Life. Those were his five solo songs and he co-contributed to Wait and The Word. In fact, he had most of, he did most of the work on The Word. But uh, Norwegian Wood's particularly interesting for its subject matter. He wasn't just, the, the Beatles on the whole here are not writing boy girl love songs. Um, they're writing more interesting, about more interesting material, whether it be clandestine, you know, trying to cover up something or not. Uh, it's just very interesting imagery in Norwegian wood. Um, I lit a fire, isn't it good, Norwegian wood? Um, what does it mean? <laughs> I'm not sure, but it sounds good and it, it sounds uh, very interesting. And, and Lennon also tackled another subject, different subject matter in, in my life, where he's, he actually started off trying to talk about his childhood and name all the streets from Liverpool and it was going nowhere. And then he fell asleep and then came up with the final song in my life. And it's a delightful sort of reminiscent song about childhood and the friends and loved ones that he's lost and loved over the years. And uh, a lot of people pick this, uh, would pick this for a, a song to be played at their funeral. I know Andrew Brooks, you you, you would choose this one. Um, it's just a, prefer, a perfect song really. And George Martin contributes this harpsichord thing which was played at half speed or recorded at half speed and then played back at the normal running speed and made the piano sound like a harpsichord and very effective, although it's a little bit incongruous versus the rest of the song, but it's fairly minor criticism. Girl is a wonderful song about, Lennon said it was about the dream girl who he hadn't met yet and it turned out to be Yoko who said, but um, very dreamy lyrics and as we know, slightly naughty backing vocals in the background from, from Paul and George. Um, Nowhere Man, uh, perhaps my least favourite out, out of the well-known ones from John on this album. It's a little bit overplayed but, and a little bit long, probably half a minute too long, but uh, very noticeable three-part harmonies from John, Paul and George. Um, they hadn't really used them on the Help album, although the B-side, Yes It Is, contributed superb three-part harmony, as did the B-side of I Want to Hold Your Hand, This Boy. But on, on this album, they really are singing three-part harmony quite a lot on quite a few tracks. And it just adds another dimension to the whole band. Uh, Run For Your Life um, has come in for some stick for the words, but uh, I think that, that was a bit of an overreaction. It's just about a, a guy who's jealous and doesn't want his... Uh, when he says, I'd rather see you dead than to be with another man, he's not talking literally. He's not going to murder her. But um, anyway, a lot of people get upset about that lyric. I, I think it's okay. It's not his best song, although George Harrison apparently loved it. Um, John hated it himself. Uh, from Paul, we've got Michel, where, and everyone talks about yesterday as being a timeless classic, and of course it is, but Michel is right up there. And if you remember, when, on, I showed you the a collection of Beatles oldies but goldies, and Michel found its way onto that album along with yesterday, and deserves, in my opinion, just as much recognition as yesterday, if not more, because it, it's got John's contribution um, in the middle, you know, I want you, I want you, I want you, or I need to, I need to, I need to, I need to make you see. Um, whereas, as John said in the Playboy interviews, without his contribution, it's just a straight love song from Paul, albeit very clever love song with clever use of French. But John's middle eight or middle bit sort of takes the song into an, another direction and makes it a better song overall. And, and I actually prefer it to yesterday, probably because it hasn't been played so much. Um, either live or on the radio or or, by, or just in general. So that was a tour de force from Paul and I'm looking through you as a great mature love song and not talking about just, you know, and I love her or um, things we said today or all my loving. Things are a little bit strained in his relationship with Jane Asher perhaps and he's using that in the lyrics to great effect. The same with You Won't See Me. Um, Again, very honest lyrics um, and quite quite interesting and in, in the first time we'd seen that from Paul talking about although what you're doing from Beatles of Sale was a bit of a kind of um, songs about problems in a relationship come to think about it but he takes it to another level on, hit on this album and Drive My Car um, is just a wonderful song with great musicianship and George and Paul are sort of double tracking this bass line and the guitar line together and um, I think I was inspired by some George, song that George loved. I can't remember the name of it. Um, 
Respect, I think it was called. And then, um, uh, what else can we say? Drive My Car, yeah, lots of double entendre in the lyrics, perhaps. But uh, you don't need to read that into it if you don't want to. It's just fun lyrics and a great, a great opener to the album. Um, probably their best to date, Al although I saw her standing there. It's obviously a superb opener to Please Please Me. Um, and then we've got a couple of songs John and Paul did together. Wait was the leftover from Help, which they reworked, which is quite decent, nothing amazing. And The Word, most noticeable actually for the words, <laughs> pun not intended, um, about, you know, the word is love. And this was a couple of years before the summer of love, or 18 months before. And, you know, in the good and the bad books that I have read, um, I've heard it said, the word um, is love. And I think it's a very effective song. Again, good good harmonies from the, from the three of them. Um, if I Needed Someone shows us George really maturing as a songwriter. This, this song is head and shoulders above the two tracks he did on Help both lyrically and musically, and using that 12-string guitar to effect, which had inspired the birds to use following his 12-string work on Hard Day's Night. And Think For Yourself is an interesting number, quite interesting lyrically, um, not the best melodically perhaps, but pro probably most noticeable for the fuzz bass played by McCartney. Um, and then Ringo gets his first songwriting co-credit with What Goes On, co-written co with Lennon McCartney. Apparently he'd been attempted in 63, but didn't get anywhere. So Ringo sings quite a nice lead vocal and good harmonies from, from John and Paul on the chorus, um, but perhaps not the strongest song on the album. So this album had a big effect on the Beatles' peers. I think Pete Townsend is on record saying it inspired him and the Velvet Underground similarly, or Lou, um, Lou Reed and John Cale were separately. I'm not sure if they'd formed the Velvet Underground at that stage, but they were inspired by this album. The Beach Boys, Brian Wilson said it inspired him to do Pet Sounds the following year to make it even better. Um, I think it had a, an a, a ongoing effect on the birds. Um, I think people began to realize that it was uh, you know, one better start trying to make albums, not just singles, and a concerted effort to make, you know, a whole string of songs w without a weak link. And I think this is about perhaps the first occasion where that is literally the case. There's, um, there's no filler on this album whatsoever, in my opinion. Now, mono versus stereo, I don't know. I don't have a great preference, but I think the original stereo was too separated, as I've said, so I'm glad they did a, a new job. I'm not sure if it needs Giles Martin um, to do another remix. I'm just going to read you a bit of the Carr and Tyler review of this album, because it's quite, quite well written. There is so much of consequence on this album that we now enter the territory where critical, critical commentary becomes almost purely subjective. For a start, it's crushingly obvious that the brief hiatus, which had lingered during the Beatles for Sale help period had been banished, perhaps with a little an assistance from a certain shapely and verdant brackets and a legal mid-oriental plant. Rubber Soul is the Beatles' first step into the mystic, and although subsequent albums seem to extrapolate these visions much further, the insight and cutting social comment showed that the group had ditched the Jelly Babies forever. They were a studio band, pure and simple. Touring had long since become a question of going through the motions and they go on to praise that album almost complete without uh, uh, I think you know unequivocally praise it and, and with you know I, I don't think there's many albums which deserve total praise but this is this is one of them and I, th I think I've said in a previous video if uh, if I was to encounter a Martian who just landed on this planet and I had to introduce him to the Beatles I think you can do a lot worse than start him off with Rubber Soul um, Whereas the fans tend to say Revolver or the White Album is their favourite, the critics tend to say Pepper and Abbey Road. Rubber Soul seems to get a little bit lost in the mix, and but not for me. It's right up there, and on on many days it's my go-to Beatles album. If I, you know, particularly this time of year in the summer, although it's <laughs> released in December, it seems to me quite a summery album and quite an uplifting album. And I haven't got a bad word to say about it. So thanks for watching. See you next time.